So I'm going to talk a little bit about basically applied AI uh, for accessibility specifically. Uh, and I'm Alex Dunn. Online you'll find me a suave pirate because Alex Dunn is an extremely ordinary name. Uh, you may know more than one Alex Dunn. Uh, and when I started my, my career in, in development, I was like, all right, let me get my online presence figured out. Let me go find out what I can do with Alex Dunn, like Alex Dunn Dev or something like that. Uh, and it turns out, you know, I work a lot in the Microsoft space and in the AWS space, and there are three Alex Dunn devs at Microsoft. So I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. I need to mix it up. I went back to my, uh, my name generator I wrote when I was probably like 11 or something like that. First name, Suave Pirate, and it's there. Uh, but I do a lot of work in uh, applied AI, voice AI, uh, and obviously accessibility and assistive tech. So we're going to share a little bit more about that today. So couple things I want to sort of start with, just in terms of how we introduce technology to people, the way that we use technology every day. In the US anyway, although this is true in many other parts of the world, we introduce technology in computers and even computing at younger and younger and younger ages. In the US, on average, the average school, that could mean a, a whole lot of different things, starts to introduce computers to students even in preschool, three and four years old, starting to actually get their hands on keyboards. Maybe they're on tablets, but they're interacting with technology, not just at home, but in the school itself. And there are even now states that mandate a requirement of at least one computer science credit in order to graduate. Regardless of IEP, regardless of status, you have to take one computer science class. You have to learn how to program. And students do all sorts of amazing things. Anyone here participate in FIRST Robotics, either in their past life in high school or middle school or as a mentor or anything like that? No? I loved FIRST Robotics myself. I mentor for FIRST Robotics. It's an amazing program where we teach kids how to build robotics, how to write code that executes simple autonomous tasks, how to use input controls uh, and do amazing things. And it starts in Lego at the age of like six. And these kids are doing amazing things. They also use it outside of school in social environments. They use it to play games a lot. And it's great. We introduce technology younger and younger, which means that we can do a lot more as a society because we can move a lot faster as everyone uses technology to develop a little bit more. But what if those kids can't use that technology? What if we have, for example, a student with a disability? whether it be profoundly visible or, or an invisible disability, what we actually start to introduce is a surprisingly systemic problem that we kind of slipped and fell into. Right? We introduce technology at younger ages, we accelerate so much faster. But when we accelerate and we leave people behind, those people are accelerating the other way. Right? It's just sort of the two sides of the equation. But we as developers, we're not to blame. It's this guy, Christopher Latham Scholes is the devil when it comes to accessibility. And it's all his fault for creating the QWERTY keyboard. Back when he took the typewriter, it's probably like the third iteration, he designed what is now our standard input model. So it's on us not to create the problem. I should say it's not our fault for creating the problem. It's this guy's fault. But it could be on us to help solve it or at least make it a little bit better uh, with more universal design and more inputs. So how do we do that? with violence. So we're going to go through a few different examples of this story of building what is called Enabled Play, uh, which is a platform built on .NET. It's got IoT. We've got a lot of cool stuff that we do with Azure. Uh, there's a lot of ML baked in in a, a few different ways. And I'm going to share the story of how we basically went through building that. And this is an actual warning. We've got some great demos, but there are some video game violence. If you're not cool with that, I would probably just say tuck away. It's not a lot. It's not super gory or anything like that, but it's usually like fantasy and a couple first person shooters. So just sort of fair warning there. All right, how many of you have seen this screen at one point in their life? I knew there was gonna be one, there's a few, okay. For those of you who don't know, this is Dark Souls, and this past screen is probably the one that you see the most often when you play this game. Dark Souls is one of the hardest games, a lot of people call it the hardest game in general, all three Dark Souls, other than Dark Souls 2, we don't talk about that, uh, and even Elden Ring nowadays. And I thought to myself, well, if I can make Dark Souls more accessible, I think we got the problem solved. We got the hardest game, the fastest pace, most cognition load that's put on a user, and we can make it actually possible for someone with a disability to play it. Let's start tackling a few different ways to, to go about it. The first thing I thought was, well, what if I could make a bot that could basically offset playing Dark Souls for me? So come with me on this little journey of how we go from just like a crazy concept of building bots that play Dark Souls better than I actually can. Uh, into something that's actually working and functioning. And along the way, we, we you know, fail and stumble. So I'm going to share the things that didn't work with you so that if you're ever curious in working with any of this technology, you don't have to bother. So a couple rules that I had in place for myself. We couldn't mod the game. We couldn't hack the game. It had to be something that could work somewhat universally. Uh, and it has to actually help. 
So the first thing I tried is image recognition to dodge our attack. Basic concept, right? This is a, a screenshot of Dark Souls 3. This is our little character. And we go, oh, there's a big scary sword. We did object recognition. We built a model that says, hey, this scary sword is coming towards us. We should choose to automatically dodge or we should choose to automatically attack. Uh, and that was cool. I started building this model. I went, did like a whole bunch of playthroughs. We were doing it on Twitch. Did a whole bunch of playthroughs. We were like grabbing screenshots, doing all sorts of labeling, trying to build this very custom model for Dark Souls 3. And what we learned when we started getting into it is that Dark Souls is a sort of game where you're always in danger. There isn't this state of like happy, oh, look, we detected something. Now let's do a roll. Uh, everything around every corner uh, is dangerous and uh, you're going to die, like no matter what. Also, I cooked an entire graphics card. Uh, I went through two different 1080 Ti's building this model and running Dark Souls 3 at the same time on max settings because I was also trying to do this like retraining stuff. So I'm like training a model on the same GPU as I'm playing the game. Uh, totally cooked one and then another one in a, a different project later on. Uh, so I was like, okay, off the table, let's do something simpler. Let's detect combat music. That's something that a lot of games have. When you're in danger, music gets scary, which means that we would just supplement inputs. We would start to roll or dodge or attack if we could detect we were in danger in a different way that wouldn't ruin my computer. Uh, and that didn't work, essentially, because it, it meant nothing. And also, like, Dark Souls has gloomy music all the time anyway. So I kind of took a break. I, I felt pretty defeated. I was playing Warzone. This is back in 2020 at the height of, of Call of Duty's War zone. And I was playing with some of my friends. I was yelling all the time, as I always do when I'm losing, calling everyone a hacker when they're just better than me. Uh, and I thought, what if I could yell to actually play the game? All the times that I'm yelling, serpentine, 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 if I could actually make my guy do serpentine. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Right? I do voice AI. I was like, I can probably make this happen. We need a voice input device. We need some way to network that and understand what the person's saying. And again, we need to receive the events and do something on the computer. So this is what the basic setup looked like. I was going to talk to a device. In this case, that device was actually going to be an Echo Dot, an Alexa speaker. I know, probably the worst thing to start with because Alexa doesn't really understand anything anyway. Uh, we needed to send that information to an API, which was then going to send it back down to an app running on my machine, which was then going to output something. So here's a quick sample of what that kind of looked like. This is on the back end side for where we're handling a request coming from the Alexa service, the Alexa skills kit. We had something for like reloading in this case. Uh, so if we got the reload intent, if I just said, Alexa, tell the Warzone controller to reload, it's a mouthful, I know. Uh, I said it very many times. Then we would basically go down this process of detecting it and then just firing it over a signal R hub to all listening clients. Because I was just doing it for myself. I have a client that's sitting there listening to the signal R hub. Uh, that's then handling the connection on armor intent or on reload intent or whatever. And then we were going to use uh, an input simulator to simulate a key. In the case of armor, it's the four key. So we hit four, we should get an armor. Uh, it was great. We went, we put it in notepad, we started running it. I was saying Alexa put on armor. We we're hitting the four, four showing up in notepad. We jump in the game. We say, Alexa, tell the Warzone controller to shoot. Again, a mouthful, uh, but nothing happens. So I was like, okay, something is off with Call of Duty. I know it's working in every other app that I've tried. Uh, I thought for a second that I got banned for like cheating or something like that, not the case. So I went to try some other games, went back to Dark Souls, literally built a whole other like similar setup, a whole other skill called the Dark Souls controller. Uh, same thing didn't work, Sekiro didn't work. Uh, then someone recommended this like browser game called Krunker and like that kind of worked. And some other things that we tried, we tried WPF with send keys, we tried WinForms with send keys, we tried extended background tasks, we tried USB over IP, and nothing actually ran in game. It would work on all these other apps, nothing would actually execute in a game. And we learned, uh, me and my little chat, after everyone's thrown all sorts of ideas around, that games actually read raw USB input and raw Bluetooth input. They do not go through the operating system's actual X input uh, or virtual input detection. You have to have something over USB. So, enter this guy, the Arduino Leonardo, my savior in this project to make games more accessible because the Arduino Leonardo is a beautiful little microcontroller that you can send stuff over the single USB port via serial and it can send real USB HID human interface device standard back. It can act as a keyboard uh, and it's got a cool name. So now this is our new diagram, right? We go, I'm talking to my Alexa device. It's hitting the Alexa skills kit. It's then hitting my API. I'm sending it over SignalR to this Windows app. Windows app sends stuff over serial to the Leonardo. Leonardo sends USB hid packets back. Uh, and we finally have a working example here in Call of Duty.
Just everyone be really quiet so we can hear it from the projector. We were using Alexa to shoot bad guys. They might, or, you know, it's, it was pretty cool. Uh, it was super slow, but maybe there's something there, right? Maybe we're actually sort of onto something. We can augment these usual inputs of keyboard and mouse or a game controller with something else. Uh, so I went back and started to basically confirm that this wasn't some weird bias that I had because I was working with one particular person with a disability. Let's go make sure that this thing is gonna actually help, uh, which is how we also go from this crazy working concept to something that becomes a real product. So first things first, what's actually out there outside of the keyboard, mouse, and controller? Uh, Microsoft has this amazing device. I think it came out in 2019. Uh, I might be wrong about that date, so don't hold me to it. Called the Xbox Adaptive Controller. Anyone seen this before, the, uh, the Adaptive Controller? It's pretty sweet. For those who haven't seen it, there's a whole bunch of uh, 3.5 millimeter audio jacks all along the side here, and then two USB ports on, on basically both ends. And you can plug in buttons that you can then lay out in a physical pattern that act as other inputs. So you could adapt it for the way that you can control your game. Take, for example, over here in the top left, we have a button mounted to a headrest. He's also using a joystick uh, that's a much larger, two different joysticks that he has with his hands. He can take his hands off the joysticks and hit a button that's in front of him. Really great for people that, have a, that struggle with fine motor control or people that have mobility challenges. It unlocked new levels of gaming for them that they couldn't have before. Other people would take you know, a physical Xbox controller and try to kind of like jerry-rig it in a position where they can can use it. Some people that, for example, play one-handed will have an Xbox controller tucked into their neck and then use the one hand and then use their chin for other stuff. Crazy stuff, and they're, they're still beating me in Call of Duty. Uh, there's other great tools within Xbox. Cortana is awesome for like navigation within menus. You're not going to use it like in games or anything, but it's pretty cool. It's also audio navigation, so like talkback features, everything like that. There's co-gaming, so the ability to have two controllers control one game, which is great for a person with a disability playing with one controller, person basically helping them out with another. Uh, Skill-based matchmaking as a concept in game design is great because if you're not performing at top levels, you're not going to get put in multiplayer lobbies with people that are going to just clown on you. Uh, although I still have a hard time with that in general. Uh, and then there's also difficulty settings in a lot of games, uh, other than Dark Souls for all of these, which is really funny. There's also some great people out there doing work in gaming accessibility. Able Gamers Charity, who co-invented the Xbox Adaptive Controller with Bryce Johnson from Microsoft. Special Effect, Warfighter Engage, working with uh, disabled veterans and the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, and like a ton more. Uh, so now let's talk about how we actually scale out this concept of like, all right, we got voice input. How do we actually turn this into something that's useful? Because now we know that the project has some weight to it. There's some value there. So going back to our little very linear diagram of just me talking to my one SignalR hub that's talking to all devices, we need to build something that can support multiple users. We need to build something that can work on multiple platforms, multiple voice services. We need to be able to support multiple end desktops, and it needs to work with more than Call of Duty. Uh, so let's talk about supporting more platforms. Uh, on the voice assistant side, I use Voiceify. It's my product on the side. Uh, that I work on, uh, which is just a single platform for voice assistance. And then for all the other client applications, we did it in Xamarin, uh, in Xamarin Forms, although now it's, it's all built in Maui uh, as of like literally a couple weeks ago, we finally got the upgrade through. Um, so now we're able to handle basically any type of voice input, any type of voice service, and we can run this and manage it from Android, from iOS, from Windows, uh, from Mac, uh, and so on. So now how do we handle multiple users? Well, in order to do that, we have to know you're the person talking to the microphone and that you're the same person that is uh, basically signed into the app playing the game. And we need to do that by authenticating you and then making authorized requests from both sides. Uh, we do that by basically adding these authentication walls. So real quick overview on OAuth. Uh, we're not going to go into depth about it, but essentially from the app side, we're using the, the Xamarin Community Toolkit. actually has a great tool for uh, actually, is this Xamarin Essentials? It might be Xamarin Essentials uh, for Web Authenticator. You literally, if you have an OAuth provider, you just kind of give it the URL and it pulls up the UI, signs in, takes it back, and then you just go refresh your tokens, which is really cool. Now, authenticating with voice assistance is harder. Um, there's a lot more steps. There's a lot of things that you have to control, and there's also a lot of things that you don't have control over that you kind of have to make sure you conform to. So this is, this is how you do signing in to Alexa, specifically. It's the same thing with any voice assistant. 
Uh, but basically, the user does something where you, your skill says, hey, I need you to sign in. I sent something to your Alexa app. Now they leave the speaker, they go to the app, there's a card that says, hey, you need to sign in. They pull it up in the UI, they do the authentication, it sends token information over to Amazon where they handle it, and now they handle refresh tokens, and then they send authentication uh, access tokens like bearer tokens or JWTs or JOTs if you're into that sort of thing, um, all the way through to your endpoint, but it's not in the authorization header, it's in the body, so now you have to like handle that differently, you can't just like bake it into like ASP.NET Core authorization. Uh, but basically now on the back end, we add bearer auth uh, in order to handle the tokens coming from the client app. So when we sign into the Xamarin app against our APIs, this is all on ASP.NET Core, uh, we're able to basically uh, deserialize those tokens, get the user ID and validate that it's, it's right and that they're good to go. And then from the client side to start authorization and authentication, this is where we use that web authenticator library from Xamarin Essentials. We just pass the URL, client ID, client secret, uh, which you should probably do from a server and not just throw in here. Get your bearer tokens and then pass it along for subse subsequent requests. Use it to connect to the SignalR hub in an authorized way. We're signed in, we can support multiple users. What a headache. Okay, now we need to be able to actually handle multiple games. We customize and personalize uh, for more people. So we have this nice little view of a keyboard. Might be a little hard to see with a kind of like bright pink on white. But you pick a key and you say, this is the commands that I want to give it. I can select the space bar and then I can say jump should be a command for the space bar. Easy mapping. Uh, and then we needed to basically make it more useful. Uh, we added macros. Double jump, hit the space bar twice. Type things out. Uh, move in a specific direction, all from a single command. Uh, which is a great way to just make it a little bit easier to use. We also have action queuing, the ability to say jump, 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 especially when you're panicking, and actually have it hit three times rather than having to wait. I'll explain in a little bit why that's kind of weird with speech recognition. Uh, and basically, here's how it actually works where we talk to the serial side, where we take that input, we take the command, we know what key we have to press. How do we actually do that with the Leonardo? We create a data writer and we write a string over to, uh, over serial, to the device and then it's gonna read it. So basically we take it, we have a hold time milliseconds and here's like the example string down at the bottom, press space 500. We're gonna hold the space bar for 500 milliseconds. So to receive it, uh, we need to basically on, this is Arduino side now, switching languages a little bit on you. Uh, we're gonna add a command for the press. So that's that first, the first word has to be a single word. The space is gonna be the denoter we have between arguments. Uh, so now we know that it's in press we need to get the space and the 500 out of it. So we get the default hold time if we have another one, then we do a whole mapping to keys where if we have space, we type a space. Uh, really not that complicated, it's like 50 lines of code to now just have it send any key and have it type back, which just feels weird, but you know, USB, it's fun. Uh, and now we need to prove that it really works. So we, we actually did a few uh, amazing hackathons. Anyone here done like dev post hackathons, online hackathons? Anyone trying to like get a quick $10,000? Because you can get some like serious winnings from these things. They're competitive project building. Uh, so in this case, we won uh, the Microsoft US hack for uh, accessibility as well as the Azure AI hack, uh, which I'll show you a little bit more about what we changed about the original architecture to make that work. On top of voice commands using Alexa, we now introduce Azure Cognitive Services for speech recognition from the app. So now you can use your mic on your laptop or from your phone and give voice commands from any of these devices over Azure Cognitive Services, turn those into commands against your little profiles you build, and then send those back over another device. Beyond that, you can also use uh, face expressions. We use Azure Cognitive Services for uh, computer vision to detect head position, smiling and not smiling, uh, turning and, and tilting, and use that to send commands too. So now you've got anything you can do with your hands, you have your voice, now you have your face as well, uh, which are all great inputs. And here's some quick examples in Sekiro uh, where we're doing it, and you can see just how slow it is as well. Oh yeah, sweet, like three second delay. We also did this really crazy project with Snapchat. Anyone here use Snapchat regularly even, a little bit? Familiar with Snapchat? It's a, yeah, you know, it's a social media app where you take pictures, you send them, and then the pictures self-delete themselves. So you could, you know, 
continue with your imagination there. Um, but they have this amazing machine learning built into it. And they have a developer platform for building what are called custom lenses. Usually people do it to like run ads uh, where you'll be like, oh, I turned my face into a Subway sandwich, $5 footlongs, am I right? Um, but what we were able to do is use the same model where you can detect all these like different face movements and like body changes in real time, offline and Snapchat, uh, and actually turn those into inputs. Now we can't just like, tell Snapchat to start sending HTTP requests, like make WebSocket connections, because that would obviously introduce some pretty big security holes. So we did something I think is pretty clever. I think it's also extremely hacky. It might be one of the hackiest things I've ever made that works. OK, so bear with me. You have an app. that It launches Snapchat with your lens. So now you have Snapchat on your phone, and you're making faces at it. You're raising your eyebrows. You're doing hand signs, fists, one up, uh, horns. You're opening and closing your mouth. You're smiling. You're turning and tilting your head and it's just flashing different QR codes on the screen. That's all the Snapchat part is. It just detects the face movement, flashes QR codes. We then built another WPF app that, <laughs> that takes any stream and is constantly checking for QR codes. So you have to now plug your phone in to your PC, open the app, and then basically stream from your phone screen through it as if you were sharing your screen. It's the same APIs that like Zoom and Teams and everything uses for screen sharing. And then whenever it actually detected a QR code, it just sent it to the platform, right? It was just like you signed into your Suave Keys account into this little Snap Reader app. A uh, lot of jumps, but it was actually super fast. Like there was a very little delay. I'll show you in this quick example. We also had some other fun with Snapchat with anime filters and, and custom filters and stuff. But you can see over here, this is my actual phone screen being mirrored with visor. Uh, and you can see the QR codes flashing when I do different things. Uh, I'll just show you a couple different commands in, in this game called Fall Guys. I should have started this video after the load screen, huh? This is like a weirdly addicting game, by the way, if you don't play Fall Guys. It's so simple and also rage-inducing. I said, that was way faster than that three second voice command delay. And at this point, I've got pretty dexterous eyebrows from all this practice. Uh, we also built a really cool Twitch plugin. You might have seen it come up a couple times where you sign into another Windows app uh, with your account and it would register to your Twitch stream, watch the Twitch chat, and if you sent exclamation point press in anything, uh, it would try to also process that command. So in this case, now in Call of Duty, over here, it's kind of hard to see. People are saying like press shoot, press jump, uh, but you'll see basically any message pop up and then it actually take action over here. Little jump. And they shoot, and everything's fine, and I definitely didn't lose. OK, so we've got all these cool different inputs. We have people typing in Twitch chat that are sending commands to my games. And of course, because it's just low-level USB, it works in every app. We have my face, we have body positions, we have voice commands. And of course, we still have the other physical inputs. There's nothing that stops us from using that alongside it. Uh, so now there's something, there's really something there, right? So now we can actually go take it to market. Uh, and this is what we call enabled play. So the things that need to go from this like prototype, just messy, I don't want you to have to install 30 different Windows apps to use this thing. Uh, and also how to not spend $30,000 in, in Azure credits uh, because I'm running computer vision 24 seven uh, at, at 30 frames per second is we need to get performance better. You saw the voice commands, uh, attack. Okay, uh, it needs to be private. Right now we are sending everything to Azure, which like is fine, and there are great privacy settings in Azure so that that stuff's not recorded. But there's something that people aren't really cool with, uh, which is having a camera and a microphone connected to the internet always streaming their data somewhere. 
Uh, and again, price because it's super expensive and we still need to scale a couple things out. So let's start with speech recognition. Uh, this is a typical process for speech recognition where we need to start recording audio. That can happen from basically volume levels kicking off a detection. That can happen from you hitting a button. If you're using an Alexa speaker, that could be a trigger from a wake word, which is offline speech recognition to then transfer into online speech recognition. You need to listen and record audio buffers, which then need to detect, hey, you stopped all of your speech, and you send this giant audio buffer up to the cloud and say, please give me the string of what they said. Uh, and then you take that and you do something with it. Uh, there's also some um, performance uh, issues with that because we are constantly streaming and then waiting for results. Uh, and especially if you have like bad internet connection or if you're just playing an offline game, it's now no longer viable. So instead what we have is predictive automatic speech recognition uh, that runs offline. So it's always on. You don't have to start listening. It's just, it's constantly sitting there running. It's always listening. It's processing partial speech. It works more similarly to like what saying, for example, Alexa or Hey Google, this wake word offline speech recognition, but with many, many different uh, commands that you can use. And it just disposes of the stream. It stays locally on the device. It never leaves, never touches the internet. And it also is insanely fast. The fastest we ever got sending a command up and down to a speech recognition service to seeing the action take place in game was 1.5 seconds before. You saw that in the live demos, none of those were close to 1.5 seconds. Those were like three to five seconds. Uh, with predictive and offline speech recognition, we're around like 30 milliseconds for saying jump, 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 and doing spacebar, 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 uh, because we're looking for those specific words uh, that you're basically speaking. Now, Let's also talk about price. Like I said, we're streaming that to Azure Cognitive Services, or even if you're using something else like Google Speech or um, Amazon's Transcribe. If you're doing that constantly, it gets expensive. Uh, whereas with offline, it's all you know basically private. There's nothing that's being sent anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing with expressions, right? So in all of these other examples, you were either streaming your face to Microsoft, or you were streaming your face to Snapchat. Or if you wanted to, again, use Amazon or Meta's different computer vision models, you're streaming it to someone else. And, and whether or not they actually save that in any way or use it in any way doesn't really matter. It's a little unnerving. Uh, and beyond that, it's also super slow because we're processing video at 30 frames per second. Each one of those frames, we need to go send and, and detect a change, detect where your face is, what expression you're making, what hand gesture you're making, uh, and then do something with it. So we took that offline as well. Uh, we're using some custom Onyx models that were built from PyTorch. Uh, I won't get into all the details of, of building basically Onyx models, but really cool cross-platform capabilities to take a computer vision model, put it in any app, and as long as you're streaming the same buffers of video, uh, then you're able to process it on any of these platforms, which is really cool, and do it all offline. So now this is what Enable Play basically looks like. Uh, we have a physical device here. This is our, our new little physical guy. Uh, it has microphones on the device itself. So it's not an Arduino Leonardo. It's built around the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4. This is my dev one, which is just a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, and a custom piece of hardware that we had designed that has two far field microphones. So pretty good range, up to like 30 feet. Put it across the living room and use voice commands. Uh, we're still using SignalR. We're still using Azure's uh, uh, app services, and uh, we're using Postgres and a little bit of Mongo behind the scenes, and then our app is still built in, in .NET MAUI. Uh, so now what we can do, for example, with this whole setup is we can have any of our devices connect to either side authorized, just like we did in the prototypes, uh, but now we can actually do something with it, like tell it to start listening uh, remotely. So for example, here's just another ASP.NET Core endpoint where we take a, a given user uh, device ID and we say, hey, you should start listening. Please turn on the microphones. Uh, and then from the um, basically client side, we're just making the post to say, here's the device ID. We pass in our bearer token. And then in this case, we have a script in Python that's also connected to SignalR that's just listening for those same events to say, OK, I should basically start listening. And then we update the status. We send it back. We tell the, the user in their app, hey, it's listening. You're good to go. And so here's a very quick example of how we do this in a game like Minecraft. Uh, I'm gonna show a couple different things. It's gonna go really, really fast. So I kinda wanna explain it beforehand. We use winking to run a command that like changes the game to daytime. We use a voice command to start moving. We use smiling to open up the uh, inventory. And then we even run a macro to build something automatically from a single command.
So here's basically how the whole process works. You sign in, you create profiles, what inputs should be what outputs. You tell it to start and stop listening by tapping a button. You can also use tilt controls, which is really cool. You can turn your phone or tablet into mouse movement. So think of it like rotating and moving your, um, your it's kind of weird in 2D, I guess, uh, but your phone or tablet, and it's like acting as if it's moving your mouse, or it can trigger commands. It can also detect shake. One of the most common things we see from students who use these devices in school is they will shake it to backspace. So they like just rage quit whatever they were just writing by shaking their tablets. You go to your camera and pull up expression controls. We're no longer dependent on Snapchat. We have our own offline expressions. Um, you can also create virtual buttons for, for all sorts of macros and things. For example, copy, paste, next, back, and start presentation for this. And you can also use remote typing and dictation, which basically turn your iPhone or your Android keyboard into your desktop keyboard. Uh, because physical keyboards aren't super accessible, swiping is and dictation is, uh, which is really cool. Now I'm going to skip this just because we don't have a ton of time, but we have a really great demo for this, which I have links to uh, with Elden Ring. And instead, what I want to do is a little bit of a live demo, and I'm hoping that you'll participate with me because I'm willing to bet that I can write code faster with my voice than you possibly can with your hands. So if you're down, if you have VS Code installed, we're going to do some JavaScript. If, if, you can, if you're down for JavaScript, we're going to write a function that just loops and, and prints out 0 to 100. We're going to write a function that adds a button to the page, and when that button is clicked, it's going to run that function. And then we're going to run the function that adds the button to the page, right? So I'll give everyone a, a minute to kind of get their situation set up if you're down to participate. And then uh, I'll pull up basically actually a video of it because I totally botched my live demo right before this. And we'll race. This is at least a real-time video that I recorded before. Anyone ready? Anyone participating? Three, two. One. And I think it's muted, so you can't even hear the voice commands. You have to believe me now. Pretty fast. Shout out GitHub Copilot, because obviously that did like all the actual heavy lifting. But hey, it's still AI and still counts for accessibility. OK, let me get back over to this. Uh, last thing, basically, we are running a pilot for a virtual controller. So if you want to be able to write code with your voice, and you don't want to have to plug in a stupid box like this, um, you can sign up for this. It's going to be free. Uh, we're also giving it away to schools and organizations that are basically trying to create more accessible workplaces. Uh, so if you have anyone or even yourself uh, want to start coding with your voice, with your hands, with your face, uh, with tilt controls, uh, and with everything else without actually needing to buy anything or do anything, you just run the app. Um, Sign up for this pilot, and we'll get you a copy of the app uh, early access. Cool. I'll wait for, I'll wait for the, the QR code scan in the back. Last thing I sort of want to reiterate, right? Going back to the original problem, we, we kind of accidentally created some systemic issues with lack of accessibility. We as developers, I think, have some of a, somewhat of a responsibility to make the things that we build accessible to others. There's over a billion people that live with a disability, both very visible and not. It's not just people that have mobility challenges. It's not just people who are blind or deaf. Um, but most importantly, we actually have the tools. Right? This is like the best time to have ever been a software developer. Because as a single person, I was able to create something even as hacky as it is with Snapchat and turn it into something that could help people out. Uh, and now into, to, into something that's helping thousands of, of kids uh, around the country, actually in, in a few other countries as well, 
and playing games and doing their schoolwork and also with some people in terms of actually being able to work where they couldn't before. We have the tools to make a difference, um, so we should just start using them and building cool stuff. And that's it. Thank you, everyone.